coexistence between light and darkness. Coexistence between challenges and solutions. I feel that I must coexist with whom and what surrounds me to try to take it all in and create something of beauty. You don't want competition between light and darkness. That creates a sense of tension. Coexistence relieves that tension. I was never really a competitor to the true sense of the word. Once upon a time in junior high school in Winchester, Massachusetts, I was on the junior high school football team, the McCall Sachems. Well, it did not last very long. Because I was too much of a peacemaker and I was not a competitor. During practice one afternoon when we had scrimmage, instead of taking the ball and running toward the opponent's goal line, I grabbed the ball and skipped and danced towards our own goal line, put the ball down, put my hands together, bowed, and blew everybody a kiss. Well, that was not a very good career move for a football player. So therefore, therefore I flunked out of football. However, during that time, my career as a nerd, as a geek, as a weirdo, and somebody being very different, blossomed. The projects that we're working on right now to create a computer-controlled, animated, lighted, clear plastic raincoat is going to demand all my skills as an artist, as an artisan, as an engineer, as a technician, as a software engineer, as a geek, as a nerd, and as a weirdo. But that is my role. The project is going to take light, color, darkness, animation, get them to coexist together and coexist with the world around them. This is episode number three of the indefinitely long series of videos. In this episode, I'm going to try to construct the circuit that we designed in episode number two, and we're going to write the software to test the new circuit. So we're going to spend a lot of time here in my workshop and a lot of time shackled to a computer writing the software. I'll be writing the software in a language called C. C is an old language written by Carnegie and Ritchie at Bell Laboratories in the 1960s. They also created the Unix operating system, which is the precursor or the grandfather of the Linux operating system, of which many of you know now, and the operating system that runs on the Raspberry Pi. I don't know how long I'm going to take to do this, and can I fit it in one video? I doubt it. But I just learned that Bellingham Television here in Bellingham has a limit of one hour, 59 minutes, and zero seconds for a video. Otherwise, they'll cut me off. So let's see how far we can go. Most likely, we're going to have to say 
to be continued. So, come along with me. Help me coexist with light and color and darkness and motion within ourselves and coexist with the beauty that surrounds us in the outside world and the universe to create a beauty that all of us can enjoy and be part of. Okay, you, here you see the Raspberry Pi, and you see the prototyping board, and here are the various components that we'll be using. Now, we're not going to worry about this for now. Let's create the circuit here first. So let me zoom in on the prototyping board to explain how this works. Each one of these holes is where you can insert a wire, something like that okay now each row of holes is connected together like a bus but it's separate from the adjacent bus and is separate from the bus across the main aisle which makes it great for inline IC chips now what's special is you see a section of holes here with a blue line next to them and another section with a red line next to them, then you have a gap. So these five buses here are connected together. There's a gap. These five are connected together. Now, the, on the blue side is separate from the red side. So, the, the blue is intended to be ground. So, this would be the ground, and this would be the power. Now, these are separate. You can say you have five volts of power here and 12 volts of power here but we're not going to bother with that we're just going to do ground and five volts then we're going to have a data in and data out clock in and clock out so let's kind of get going we're going to first zoom in and we're going to do our work on this side of a prototyping board so we can get closer in so Resistors are fairly, okay, the resistors are fairly basic. The MOSFETs are tricky. Now, if you look down from the top of the MOSFET, let me just, I'm just going to insert it so you can see it. If you're looking down from the top of the MOSFET, you see the flat part, okay. The flat part is right here, okay, and there's three leads, okay. And... The diagrams that you see have you looking down from the top. So if you're looking down from the top, the lead to your left is the source. The lead in the center is the, is the gate. And the lead to the right is the, is the drain. Okay? Now, the source... If you remember from the schematic, the source is grounded. To make things a little easier, we're going to move this down. We're going to connect it in the center section, center of each. So now the it's hard to see the wires, but you can see now on this MOSFET, the source is connected to this bus. The drain, the gate is connected to this bus, and the drain is connected to this bus, okay? Now, we know that the source for each of the MOSFETs is going to be going to ground. So let's have the sources of both MOSFETs coming together on the same bus, something like this. You notice? now that the flat part of this MOSFET is opposite the flat part of this MOSFET. That's because the source is to your left on this one, the source is to your right on that one. So this, this bus here needs to go to ground. 
So we'll take a while. Take that bus that's shared by the sources of both MOSFETs. So we're going to connect it to the row of pins adjacent to the blue line. So this row will be ground. Now, the middle pin on each of the MOSFETs, of course, is your input. And you go through an input resistor. So we're going to take a 1000 ohm resistor, insert one lead on the center lead of each MOSFET, and we're going to go to the adjacent bus. Okay, so this bus here, oops, let's get that straightened out. This bus here is going to be the input for the data coming from the Raspberry Pi. Take a resistor from the center pin like that to another bus like that. So this is the input for the clock. Right here is the input for the clock from the Raspberry Pi. This is the input from the data from the Raspberry Pi. So that takes care of the input stream and the source. Now, for the drain, the drain is going to be the connector on the far left on the MOSFET on your left. So that is to put the resistor from the drain to the red, and the bus with the red stripe, that's for your five volts. Remember, this is a pull-up resistor to five volts. That's the drain for the data MOSFET. Next, we're going to do the drain for the clock MOSFET. So now, I get this in here. Look carefully. This resistor goes from the drain, which is the lead on the MOSFET on your right, to the far right of that MOSFET, going to the 5 volts. Likewise for the data, the drain is on the far right lead of the MOSFET on your, I'm sorry, on the left. The left lead of the MOSFET to your left, right lead of the MOSFET for your right. So now we have the MOSFETs wired, we gotta do the uh, output. So the output for data comes from the drain, which is the lead to your left, on the MOSFET to your left. And we're gonna go to another bus right here, okay? So this is output for the data, and we're gonna do the same thing on the clock, which is the right hand lead of the MOSFET on your right going to another bus like so. Okay, so now here's input for data, output for data, input for clock, output for clock. It's a little bit hard to see it on the image. I guess you can see those, all right? Now, Next, I'm going to have to move the, you know, I guess the camera's fine. Next, we're going to connect the power source. We're going to take a wire, connect it to the blue, the bus for the blue side, and another wire, connect it to the bus on the red side, like that. Then, these are the clip leads from the power supply. We're going to initially set all voltages to zero for safety. This is plus five volts, and this is minus five volts. Now we have power connected to the circuit. Okay, next we have to connect the circuit to the Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to zoom back out. To help understand what's going on here, on the computer screen you see the pins and what they're for. And the way the pins are numbered, you look at this row of pins, the double row of pins. 
the pin on the upper left hand corner, which is this one here, um, that's pin number one. The one to the right of it is pin number two, three, four, five, six, and so forth. So we're going to start from pin one. Pin one is three volts. We don't care about that. That's three volts from the Raspberry Pi. We're not going to do anything with it. Pin two is five volts. Now we're supplying five volts to the Raspberry Pi using a USB interface right now. For, for this work, we're not going to bother with pin number two. However, later on, when this is part of the outfit, it, we very well could be using that pin along with the pin below it, which is actually pin number four to furnish the five volts for the Raspberry Pi. We're going to skip them for now. The, the pin on the left and the second one down, which is pin number three, that is a general purpose input-output pin, GPIO, to be used for input or output. We're going to use that as an output, and this is going to be the data pin. Uh, the data from the Raspberry Pi, it would go to, so that so the wire goes from pin number three here over to the data input, which is at this resistor right here, okay? Now, pin number four, of course, is five volts. We're going to skip that. Next is pin number five, which is the third one down on the left-hand row of pins. That's going to be the clock output. That's going to go from pin number five over here to this resistor for the clock. So I'm going to show. I'm going to go ahead and wire those. Now the next one on adjacent to five is pin number six, which is the third one down on the right. That pin will be connected to the ground bus, which is this bus here. That provides the ground. So here we go. I can find the wires I've been using. So. You can ignore the labels on the wires. These were used for a previous project. So let's do the ground first. That's the easiest. So the ground on the Raspberry Pi, which is the third one down, will go to the ground bus over. Let's see, this is stranded wire watching. It makes it very difficult to use with prototype boards. Let's get that in there, okay, without shorting out. Okay, so now, pin number five, pin one, two, three, four, pin number six, which is ground, third one down on the right, is now connected to the bus adjacent to the blue line. So that's the ground connector. Now, next, we're going to do the data output from the Raspberry Pi to the gate of the data MOSFET. Let me strip the wire, okay. All right, so this is gonna go to pin number three which is the second pin down on the left. Let's see if I can reach in there. Minding that the Raspberry Pi is powered up, so I'd have to be very careful not to short anything out. Okay, so that connected to pin number three, confirming pin number three. That's gonna go over here to the input resistor here which is right there. So that's the data input right there that we just wired. Okay, now we'll grab one more wire for the clock input. Okay, so now we're going to connect pin number five, which is the third down on the left, like that, very 
Okay, so pin number five is clock. So that goes to this resistor here, like that. So now we got ground from the Raspberry Pi, which is the red wire, data from the Raspberry Pi, which is the green wire, and clock from the Raspberry Pi, which is the yellow wire. Okay, we're done connecting the circuit to the Raspberry Pi. Now, before we can do anything else or testing or observing with the oscilloscope, we need to do some programming on the Raspberry Pi. Here we're on a terminal session to the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi, which is the computer, is running the Linux operating system. It is not running Mac or Windows. And a terminal session is an interactive session with Linux. It's kind of old fashioned. It's not a point and click. You communicate it typing commands into it. Now, if I do an ls, that means list the directory, what files are on it, okay? This was some stuff I was doing some testing earlier. We're going to ignore this right now. However, while we're here, we need to make a copy of the Get repository for lighted raincoat. That's where I am keeping everything on GitHub and making it available to you. <clears throat> so what we have to do is say git clone https colon slash slash github.com com slash m a a l l y n slash l i g h t e d raincoat dot g i t. Let's see what happens with that. Okay, it looks like we're successful. Now, if I do an l s again, we see a directory right here, lighted raincoat. Anything in purple is a directory. It's different colored files for different pieces. Like for example, here's an MP4. That's in kind of magenta. And here's white, which is a regular file. And, and red, looks like it means a package or a special file. So we're going to do the CD sync, which means change directory to lighted raincoat. Okay, do an LS here. We see two files, license and readme. We also see a file called new underbar level. That directory contains all of the files that we have worked on in the last video to create the schematic, the simulation, and the printed circuit board. We're going to make a new directory, which means mkd, whoops, dir, Test dash software, okay. Then ls. There's the new directory right here. We're going to cd change directory into test dash software, okay. Now we're ready to start to write a small test program to make the outputs go up and down. Here we are in the test software directory because there's nothing here. So we're going to make a small program. Now VI is the visual editor that I use under Linux. It is extremely old and is extremely cryptic. But since it's the only one I've been using since about 1980, I still use it today. There are lots more editors, many probably far better, and some that are point and click. 
VI very arcane and cryptic. I will try to help you along. We're going to say VI test program. What test under bar program dot C. The dot C suffix means this is a C program. You can have dot PHP for P PHP. You can have dot PY or dot Python for Python, dot PL for Perl, dot RU for Ruby, and so forth and so on. We're going to go ahead and open the editor. You see a blank screen with a bunch of squiggly lines on the left. Each squiggly line means that that is a text line. This is a text editor. The file we're going to create is a text file. Now, to get things going, right now, without doing anything, we are in um, operation or initial command mode. We're gonna, we want to type in characters, so we need to go into insert mode. So let's, on the keyboard, tap the key I. You see nothing changed, but we are now in insert to anything we type on the keyboard will go into the file. Well, the first thing we have to do is to tell the compiler to include some predefined C files or .h files for header files. These include definitions for C program elements to use the system facilities in Linux as well as graphics as well as, in our case, the wiring PI interface and so forth. We will be adding header files as we go along. So we're going to start simple now, but as we go along in this project, depending upon the features I wish to add, we will undoubtedly add additional header files. So let's get started. You say bracket include s no my mistake i already made a mistake it's going to be pound include open bracket stdio dot h stdio is short for standard input and output that allows me to have the program ha print something on the terminal or take input from the keyboard Things like that. It does not include the C, uh, the the out, input and output pins. That comes later. Another header file that I include is stdlib.h. That's for standard libraries. There may be things that we'll be needing to do to utilize features of the Linux operating system. So there are some definitions in that file to use those. Next, we're going to say include errno.h. That's error numbers. There are various error codes that the operating system will issue if there's an error in trying to execute a feature of the operating system. I think that's it for now. There'll be more, but one more, very important. I'm going to say include, if I can find it, W-I-R-I-N-G-P-I-H. That library has all of the defines necessary to be able to manipulate the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi using the wiring PI interface, as I mentioned earlier. So that's it for the include files that we're going to use now. So right now, before I do anything with the GPIO pins, let's make a very, very simple program to write something on the screen and just exit. 
just to show you the basics. Every C program will have a function called main. Main is the top level. That's the, that is what's called when the program is invoked. The main parentheses, there's two parameters to it. One is a character, and one is an integer. That's integer for the number of arguments. A-R-G-C. Argument count. Now, let me, let's stop here and explain. Arguments are what you can type in after through you invoke the name of the program. So you're on the command line. You would say test dash software space my space name space is space mark space. That will get passed to the program. My name is mark. That's four separate arguments. So that number so the R A R G C will be number four. Then the next argument or the next parameter is the a an array of arguments. So it's A R character star star A R G V. Now star star means pointer to a series of pointers this is where c gets very very arcane compared to much more user-friendly languages um i have to bear with me as i use this that means this is a pointer it points to an index of pointers each of those pointers points to a string of characters. That's the definition of main. Now, let's do the program itself. Every program is surrounded by curly brackets. And every function is also surrounded by curly brackets as well as loops, things like that. So a block is what's surrounded by curly brackets. So we're going to start the main program, main block, and we're going to do one thing, P-R-I-N-T-F. That means print format, open, bra open parentheses, quote, hello out there. Okay, now. The next thing we're going to put in here is a little tricky, is a backslash N. That means carriage return and line feed. This is how harks back to the old days of teletypes when we were doing programming back in the 70s. We did not have these windows. We use a real teletype that has paper. Carriage return means you return the carriage. This is the beginning of the line. A line feed means you roll the paper up one line, just like an old-fashioned typewriter. Then we close the parentheses, and we end with a semicolon. And semicolon ends every statement in the program. Now, you may wonder, how does the compiler know about the function called printf? Printf is defined in this header file here. So we don't have to define it. It's already defined. Okay, now we're going to do a carriage return and close the brackets. So that's a block. So now we're in insert mode. We need to write this to the file called test program.c and we need to exit the editor. So first of all, how do you get out of the insert mode? You press the escape key. You notice that the cursor moved very so slightly. I always press the escape key one or two times until you hear the sound beep or whatever just to make sure that you are in the local command mode. Now, we need to save this to a to the file. So we do colon. Now watch what happens when I press colon. 
You see the colon appears the lower left hand corner of your screen of the window. That's a main command, it's a different type of command than the command mode we're in. So you say colon W means write it to the file. Okay, it says test program dot C, new file nine lines. Okay. Say colon again Q. We're going to quit the editor. Okay, now do an L S you see a program, test underbar program dot C. Now, if you want to look at it without going into the editor, you say cat, cat concatenate, test underbar program dot C. Oops, uh, let's see, I made a mistake dot C. Let's see what that, there we are. There are those lines, so that's the file. It's a simple text file. We cannot run it. We can't do anything with it because it's only a bunch of letters. We have to make it into what's called an executable. So you invoke what's called a compiler that reads this text and creates a binary file called an executable file. Now, to run that, it's a little tricky, but I'm going to show you later on how to make it easy. So, we're going to say here, GCC, that's the name of the compile, GNU C compiler. I know it's a bit arcane, GNU was the organization that created the C compiler back in the 1970s and 1980s. Now we're going to have to add a parameter, dash L. That means include a library. Now a library is a pre-compiled part of the program that has several functions in it. This particular library has all of the necessary things for the wiring PI library. Although this program doesn't use it, we will need to get used to including it. So I'm going to go ahead and include it. W I R I N G P I. That includes that library. Next, we're going to say the name of the program, which is test underbar program dot C. Now let's see what happens. Okay, it looks like we made a mistake. Ah, we got a warning. We can take care of that. Now the reason we got the warning is that main returns a value in the form of, in, of an integer. You don't have to use it, but it tells the operating system, did your program execute successfully? This is very important for people who create scripts um, scripts are yet an additional programming language that you can run to run a bunch of programs automatically on your system. Those scripts need to know if this program pro, um, executed okay. We're not going to use it now, but let's get in the habit of including it. So we can escape colon WQ. And by the way, I forgot to mention something. I'm going to go back in again. If you're in command mode, if you use the arrow key, you can move around in your program. And say you want to add something here, okay? You move to where you want to insert something. You type the I, and then you can start typing. We're not going to do that now. We're going to do backspace, backspace, escape to get out of insert. We're not going to include those characters. Now, if you want to quit without writing, say you really mess things up, you do colon, quit, exclamation point. That means force it to quit, because if you quit, 
just do Q. It will not let you quit if you have changes that were not written to the file. But we don't want to make any changes. So you quit exclamation point and we're back into the lot uh, into the shell. This is called the shell, by the way, when we're not in any editor or program. This is called the shell. Now we're going to try the C command again. Now, in the Linux shell, if you previously typed in the command, you can do up arrow, up arrow until you find the command you previously wrote. Let's see what happens. You notice nothing seemed to have happened except that it returned a shell prompt. This is a when you see the dollar sign right here and all this stuff here that's called a prompt it's essentially saying now what what do you want me to do I'm sitting here give me something to do so I'm going to type ls list directory you see two files a program that we just wrote and a very arcanely named program called a dot out that is the binary if by just doing the compile without any additional parameters, you get a dot out. If you, got, if you say dot slash in the current directory, run a dot out. Whoops. A dot out. Oh, come on. Okay. That means it's going to look for the file a dot out in your current directory. The dot slash means the directory in which we're sitting now. It's going to find that file and execute it. So let's see what happens. It says hello out there. We wrote our first program and was able to execute it. Before we go on any further in writing code. Let's make life easier for ourselves when we're doing the compiling of the code. Now here we are where we left off. Oh, let's see. We have the program, testprogram.c. So we had been compiling it, doing something like this. GCC testprogram.c. Okay. And then do the, you see that strange file a dot out? Let's try to find a way not to have that file, but just to have test underbar program. Okay. Now there's a few things I want to point out. Let's go back into the program. The made a few changes. I think from when we left off, we added some header files. Um, of features that we'll be using in the Linux operating system, including, of course, the wiring PI. Okay. Each of these header files are, will require link, what's called uh, linking in, I'll explain that later, of a library. Now, the library that we'll be using a lot is wiring PI. That's a library. So, if we now, for the program we have right now, we don't need the link in that library. But if we did, we're going to have to do something like this. GCC dash L. Now, actually, GCC test program C dash L. That means include library W I R I N G P I. That's fairly cryptic, okay? And we don't want to really have to do that to remember all that stuff. We may, we may be adding a lot of library as this journey continues on. So, let's do things the lazy way, but the safe way. First of all, let's rm remove a dot out. That's executable. Okay. There is a feature within Linux and Unix called make. You execute a single command, and it does all the compiling for you. So, in order to do that, it needs a recipe, just like the recipe in your favorite cookbook. And by the way, 
my favorite recipe for 60 out of my 67 years was brownies. It's come to the point now I don't even have to look at the cookbook. I remember my childhood brownies recipe. But that's a whole nother story. And yes, there is another video on myself making brownies. So the recipe here is in a file called make file. So we can say V-I M-A-K-E-F-I-L-E. -E. Yes, it begins with an uppercase M. Okay, now it's an empty file because we have not done anything yet. So I'm going to hit I to go into insert mode. First thing we're going to say is CC is equal to GCC. Now, what that means is we're going to have an alias in the make file, uppercase CC, and we're going to assign it to GCC. GCC is the compiler that we're using. Of course, G means GNU, the people who made it. Now, before we go any further, GCC is actually two different programs in one. One is called the compiler. That takes the human readable source code, the thing that we type in testfile.c, and converts it into an object file, a binary object file, okay? It's got binary values in it, and you cannot read it. But that is not enough to execute it on your machine. The, there's another step, and that is called linking. What linking does is takes your object file, the binary that you created when you compiled, and links it or stitches it together with other needed object file for the library, the wiring PA library, and other libraries. Once it does that, it creates a binary file called an executable file. So there's two things going on, compiling and linking. Now, both of those have their own quirks. Okay, whoops. The compiler has flags. These are things you pass along to the compiler to tell, tell it to do things in a certain way. So there's a value, C, F, L, A, G, S. Okay, that's the name of the label. C flags, oops, we're going to say equals dash G, that means include debugging information, dash I. That means look for any header files in these directories. The first directory is dot, which is current directory. Then we're going to say dash I space dot slash include. Now what that means is that if I, if I specify any header files that are not found in the standard system header directories, look for them first in the current directory and look for them in the dot slash include. So I later on in this project, I will add a subdirectory, include, and put my own header files in that directory. That will happen later. So those are the flags we use for the compiler. Okay, now, the next set of flags are for the linker. So it's LD, linker loader, F-L-A-G-S, is equal to, again, uh, is equal to minus G, a, Again, let's include all debugging information. Then dash L. Dash L tells this, the linker where to look for libraries outside of the standard system library directories. And we have one slash USR slash local slash live. Now, in the event that 
I will make my own libraries. If this project becomes big enough and I create my own libraries, then I would add uppercase, you know, dash uppercase L, then dot slash libs. I would have a new library of libs. But that's only if I decide to make my own library. The more on that later in this journey. The only other flag is dash lowercase l w i r whoops misspelling i r i n g p i. That means include the library for wiring p i. That's the only additional library we need to include for now. The libraries used for printf and other common Linux functions are included in libraries that are automatically linked in by default. Wiring PI is not one of them. Okay, that takes care of the flags. Now, what we're going to have now is a define all. Okay, if you say make space all, it's going to say, okay, what is all mean? What what is everything? Okay, right now we only have one thing. Test under bar program. Okay. So it says, okay, we need to end up with a file called test program. Okay. So now how in heck do you end up with a test program? So we're going to define test program colon. Now what do we need to do the steps needed to make test program, which is the executable binary? Well, currently we only need one file, and that's test program dot o. Whoops. Uh, let's see, where is o? Right there. Dot o. That's the object file. Remember I explained about the object file. So, in order to make the executable test program, we need the object file for test program. So, now, what do we do when we have the object file? How in heck do we magically transform it into the executable? So, you next line, you do a tab. You have to have a tab. And these are the steps to do. CC, dollar CC, that means that's the tag that we created. Call that tag, which is actually GCC, which is defined here, space dash O. That means create the file by this name. So this is where we're not going to have the A dot out, but test program. So we're going to write that down to test under bar program. So the linker. This, by the way, is running the linker. The linker would take the test program dot O and anything else and put them together to create test program. Okay, that's what we're going to output. Now, after that, then we're going to tell it all the files we'll need. So obviously, we need test program dot C and Following that, we're going to say LDFLAGS. Now, right now, my program only needs one object. One, my object file here only needs one source file and any libraries. Okay, LD flag was, will have the one library. So, library wiring PI, library STDIO, which is included by default, and test program will, um, I'm sorry, the LD, yeah, okay, will be all bundled together to create test program, okay? So that's how we're going to create the uh, the binary. But now, 
how in heck are you going to get the object file, which is this one? Well, let's define that. Oh, we can't do that. By the way, interesting thing with the editor. If you want to add a line, or at the last line of the file, you hit O on the keyboard in the c command mode. That makes a new line and goes into insert mode. So at this point, we're going to say test program dot. Oh, oh, I don't want to do that. I hit a key by mistake. Uh, oh. For testprogram.o, we will need the file testprogram.c. That's the source file that we have made. Now, what is the magic that we need to do to go from testprogram.c to testprogram.o? Carriage return, tab, dollar sign, paren, cc calling the same program but now with a dash C now what dash C means let's compile this but don't try to run the linker but that's gonna be run separately okay then we're going to say C flags okay now C flags is here so it's gonna pass these flags to the compiler okay then test program dot C okay so what that's going to do the compiler this is going to be running as a compiler it's going to grab these flags here as well as the source code program then it's going to do its magic to create test program dot O then the linker would grab test program dot o which was just created by the compiler and create test program okay now that's really all there is needed but let's make things easier we're going to define a value objects and it's going to be equal to test program dot o okay there'll be other objects added to this now target target is the executable we only have one right now and that is test program okay very simple okay now next we're going to define a value called clean that means remove all the objects and remove all the executables we want to do a full compile okay so um normally if there's any files the objects or the executable and those files are current it will skip that step but sometimes we just don't want to do that now clean means we're going to get rid of everything that so we don't need any files I'm leave, leaving the requirements clear let's go next line tab rm dash f remove by force all objects and all targets okay that's clean now the next step we've always had it I've never understood what it is it's dot p h o n y colon default and clean i think it default means the all okay clean okay is clean i'm not sure but we always we've always added that it's one of these quirks of the linux make system okay let's do a co colon wq write and quit now right now we have a make file and we have test program dot c if we just type make you notice two things happened it executed the compiler first okay that creates the object file then it executed the linker which created the executable so if i do an ls right now 
was the make file, test program, which is the executable. And notice we no longer see a dot out. We see the source file and we see the object file. Okay, now in Linux there's a file, another command called file. It tells you what kind of file it is. So I'm going to look at all the files and have it tell me what kind of files they are. Make file is a make file script, ASCII text. Test program is an ELF 32 bit executable. What kind of executable? All of this kind of stuff. What is linked, libraries, all this junk. Test program is a C source ASCII text. And test program.o is an ELF 32 bit relocatable. Okay, that's a binary relocatable object file. Okay, but it's, but it's not executable. So that tells you what kind of files they are. Okay, that's it for the make file, but once again, we're going to be adding more to this file as we add complexity to this project. We're going to now make a program that will actually move the data, data lines, the see GPIO line from 0 to 1 to 0 just to twiddle them. So we can look at them on the oscilloscope to make sure that the very basic operation of the circuit that we just made is going to be okay and that nothing will uh, burn out or whatever and um, you know, that the basic stuff is okay and then later on we go and hit it some with some really high speed stuff. So to save time, I've cheated a little bit and made some changes in the code that you see here. Um, we've, I think we had all these include files. I explained that these are files that are like C files and, but you don't, you don't actually see them here. You can, read them or look at them and the way to do that and I can show you that that if you want to see what's in the header file let's look at say wiring pi.h okay let's first do a control uh, escape then colon control wq then we're going to do actually we're going to do this cat test program.c because I just cannot remember anything. So what we're going to do cd user minus, no, we're going to do find. That means look everywhere under slash user, which is a system directory. Look at all files and find a file by the name dash name um, let's see uh, wiring whoops wiring pi.h we're using the center the mouse copy and paste okay let's see what we got and there it is okay um and we're not going to bother to look continue to look so i do the control c to stop that command so now we can say vi slash user include wiring uh, wiring pi.h okay so this is the header file okay now this includes all the stuff that you need to manipulate the wires it's variables okay I'm sorry defines these are labels like input 0 output 1 pulse width modulation output 2 stuff like that pull up pull down okay all these defines, then we have here a structure, okay, a data structure. Now, a data structure is like a very complex variable, okay, type, okay. It's not just an integer. It's not just a character. It's not just a floating point number. It's not just, you know, a, a um, double character, anything like that. It's a complex data type. So, Think of a one-room cabin out in the middle of nowhere. I know that you all have vacationed in a place like that. Just one room, okay? 
So the the one room cabin is like this simple variable here, integer pin base. That's just a simple variable. Think of that as a one room cabin. But this whole structure is like a big, huge mansion with many rooms in it. You have this room here. You have that room there. You have a, another room, a different type of room there. Uh, void. That's a. This happens to be a um, a pointer to a function. Okay. So all these are different rooms in a great big mansion. Okay. And you may not know what's in that house until you actually look at the definition. Now, oftentimes you don't have to know that. Um, there may be things in this structure that are used by the library, but not by you, the user. So you don't have to worry about that. But everything, nevertheless, is defined here in the header file. So let's get out of here and let's um, move along. So let's go back to... The program okay so we have the header files now here we're defining data too now remember that's because the data connector which is pin one two three one two three is gpio pin number two and the pin that we connect the clock to which is one two three four five is GPIO pin number three. Pin one, three volt power. Pin two, five volt power. Pin three, there is the one we're going to use for the data. This is GPIO number two. Then pin four, five volt power. We're going to ignore that for now. P pin five is GPIO pin number three. That's the one we're going to use for the clock. Okay, then pin six is ground, pin seven GPIO, pin four, and so forth. Now, as time goes on, and we're going to create more strings of lights for this elaborate garment that we're making, we'll be continuing to use more of these GPIO pins and assigning them. We will talk about that later on as we add complexity to this project. So with that being done, let's go back to the program we're working on. So I've got to figure out in, okay, how do we change? Ah, that looks like it does it. Okay, so we're defining data that's going to be GPIO pin number two. We're defining clock as GPIO pin number three. Now, here's the main, okay, same, same argument. So uh, how many arguments and the string of arguments, okay? We're not going to call it with any arguments right now, but later on we just might do that. Like, for example, we'll say start costume. So we'd say main, it would be relabeled. Start costume, pink polka dot, something like that, or whatever, okay? We don't know yet, but right now we're not going to do anything with these arguments. Okay, now, what we have here is the little bit of magic that's necessary to get the GPIO pins ready to be used for this project, okay? The first thing here is set up GPIO. It tells the Raspberry Pi, I'm going to use GPIO. You better get set up and ready for me to use it. Then we're going to say pin mode data output. Okay, now data, remember, is pin 2. So this is saying, okay, GPIO pin number 2, you're going to be used as an output pin. It could be input it could be input and output, whatever, but we're only going to use it for output. Then the next one is pin mode clock. So GPIO pin number three is also going to be for output. Now, next, we see pull up, down, control. 
data, which is to PUD up. Now, what that does, that will electronically assign an internal pull-up resistor on the data output or the out for GPIO pin 2. That seems to make sense because the outputs, the GPIO outputs, are essentially the same as the MOSFETs that we have been playing with. So you will need a pull-up resistor to pull the output to a one logic level if the MOSFET is not being driven. So we're going to do a pull-up for the data, which is pin number two. Next statement, we're doing a pull-up for clock, which is pin number three. Then after that, we're going to do a digital write, data high. Now that's saying, okay, digital write, data, which is GPIO pin number two, we're going to set it to high, because remember, High going out of the Raspberry Pi goes into the MOSFET in our circuit, which means that the output is going to be a logic level zero or low voltage. Same with the clock. Digital write clock, set it to high. Okay, so that's pretty much it to set it up. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to move the cursor down to here. Now, if you, if you, where the cursor is at the right line, if I press the O key, it's going to open another line that you can see, and we're in input mode. So we're going to do the space bar. You're going to say while. That means do something while something is true. So we're just going to say do while true. Whoops. We're going to do a while all the time. Now. We're going to create another block. We'll open bracket with a close bracket. So it's going to do forever what's in this loop. We're going to loop through it. So we're just going to, what we're going to do here, we're going to say, first of all, sleep. For one second. Okay. Then we're going to say, I'm just going to copy this and paste it, set data, and we're going to set it to low, like that, okay. Okay, then we're going to sleep one. It said, do you write clock low, oops, low, can't spell. Now, just to make life easy, I'm going to do a little trick, because we're going to have two nearly identical statements at the next Actually, four. We're going to have four more statements pretty much identical. So we're going to do go to the first of the four statements here. But we're going to copy these and, and write them in the next four statements. We're going to say we're in command mode. We're not in insert mode. We're going to say colon. Into buffer A. That's character A. Four lines. Yank. Okay, four lines yanked into buffer A. Now we're going to move the cursor down to the bottom of this. these four lines. We're going to see, quote, A, P. Okay, so now we got those new lines. So we're going to now digital write. This is going to be data. Oops. high now I change those by putting the cursor on the first character and you type X 
four times. One, two, three, four. That gets rid of them. You type I, H-I-G-H. So that changes. So now we're going to do, in this loop, we're going to sleep for a second, pull data low, sleep for another second, pull the clock low. Sleep another second, pull the data high. Sleep another second, pull the, uh, pull the clock high. And then we're going to go back and repeat the same. It's going to do that continuously, okay, until we escape it. And you escape it. And actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, now, we're going to escape it by doing a control C. So when this is running, it's going to run forever until the operator presses a control C on the keyboard and that will exit the program and go back to the operating system prompt. So that's pretty much it. Now we may add a print statement later on so you can see a print each time it outputs. Now we're going to connect an oscilloscope to the First, to the outputs of the Raspberry Pi to, con to confirm that, yes, they're moving up and down. That's appropriate. And then we're going to move the oscilloscope probes to the outputs of the Raspberry Pi or on the drain and see that they're moving up and down by 5 volts. That is all we're going to do at this point. After that, then we have to make a more elaborate program to test the timing. So with that done, we're going to do a escape colon WQ. Okay, we're going to do a make. Okay, it looks like it compiled okay, so there were no mistakes. So with this done, we're going to head to the um, Raspberry Pi itself, turn the oscilloscope on, connect everything, and then see what happens. What you see here, okay, oh boy. Um, on one screen here, let me reach over here, there are two leads to the oscilloscope going to the inputs of the circuit. This is the data input, and this is the clock input, okay? And you see the screen of the input right now with nothing going on. Both signals are high. Okay, you can see the, this is 3 volts, that's 0 volts. This is 3 volts, and the center is 0 volts. The top one is, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, that's the data one. The bottom one's the clock one. So, let's see what happens when we start the program. And I think the screen's in the right place. Let's see, CD, change directory is a lighted raincoat. There it is. Let's see. Try, uh, let's see. A CD test software. Okay. Let's uh, try this test program, see what happens. All right, let's see. Ah, then now the, up, up there. Look at that. Okay. Data. Clock. Clock. Up. Clock. Uh, uh. So that's the input going in to the circuit. But now what we're going to do, while well, it's still running, we're trying to go to the output without shorting anything out, knowing my luck, something might go wrong. Well, okay, there's one like there. And let's see, and there's the other right there. Program still running. Let's see. Ah, nothing. You know why? Because I forgot to turn the power supply up to 5 volts. Let's see what we do here. Now, how about that? Oh, look at there. That's now going up 5, up and down, 5 of 2 volts per division. So, they'll be going opposite 5 volts. So, the basic function is okay. Now, we're going to do some things much more of a hurry. So I can reprogram it, and I'll be back here. Once upon a time, when I was just a little boy, 
I visited my dear Aunt Carrie in Mechanicsburg, Virginia. We had a wonderful, wonderful time. They were a wonderful family. But like all good things, it had to come to an end. You see Aunt Carrie giving me one last hug for the camera before I had to go back home. Well, like all good things, our little session has to come to an end because Access Bellingham Television tells me it is time for you to start thinking about going home because you're nearing the end of your visit, which is one hour and 59 minutes. And the next thing I want to do will certainly take a long time. So I'm going to get one last hug from Access Bellingham, then bid farewell. There is one last thing we do need to do, and they gave me permission, just like Aunt Carrie gave me permission to eat one of her wonderful blueberry cupcakes. So, here we are in the directory we were working in, and as you can see, there are four files, okay? We have the source file, we have the object file, and we have the program. However, these files are only on this machine, of course, which is the Raspberry Pi. We need to put them safely in the repository at um, GitHub. That saves the files in a safe place so that if I accidentally step onto the Raspberry Pi when I'm fumbling around at two o'clock in the morning and I break it, the files are safe. I'm only out the $40 that the Raspberry Pi cost me, and I've got a nasty cut in my foot, but that's a whole nother conversation to have. So what we're going to do now is save it in the repository. So first of all, I do get status to show where we are. Okay, it shows that we have some untracked file in the current directory. So we're going to say get add dot. That means add everything. Actually, we don't do that yet. Oops, we made a mistake. As I, if we do an ls, we have four things. We really only need two. We need the source program, which is this one here, and we need the make file, which is this one here, okay? We don't need this, and we don't need that, okay? So, let's remove them. So, we do a make clean. Remember, we talked about that earlier. That does some magic and do an LS. Right now, we only have the good toys that we want to put safely in our toy box. So let's, um, so it's like a Christmas morning. You want to put the nice toys in your new toy box, but you want to put the ashes that your bully gave you for Christmas. You want to get rid of them so you clean your room, hence make clean. Now. Let's do this. We do a get add dot. Get add everything. So let's see what happens. Now we do a get status. Now what this means that we now told git that we have the new files. Now we just we haven't committed them. We just told git. We have these files, we're ready to commit them. So we're going to say 
git commit dash a. We're going to commit everything. Okay. Now this allows me an opportunity to say why I am doing this. Okay. So remember Christmas night. You can say, I'm putting the toys in the toy box so they will be safe so I can play with them the next morning. We're not going to say that here. We're going to say, we're going to say, made my first test program. Whoop. And made my first make, whoop, make file. Okay. All right, then we're going to say, you see down here, control X for exit. We're going to say, enter Y. Okay, and we don't type anything. All we do is hit enter. Okay, now that saved the changes to the local copy of Git. Now, <clears throat> we need to push the changes to the repository. So we say git push. Let's see what happens. Now, I have to enter my username, which is M-A-A-L-L-Y-N. I'm going to ask for a password. Let's see. All right, now we have sent the files up to the repository. Now I can show that to you. I'm going to bring a browser onto the screen. Now hopefully you can see this. Let's see if this thing's going to behave itself. I was afraid. Up, oh, up, up, up. There we are. Now we're going to go to GitHub dot com slash m a a l l y n okay there is the main panel we're going to go to lighted raincoat okay and this shows the commits my initial one the one we just made right here so we're going to go at, go to file so here is new level because that's all the stuff and here is test software we just added the new level with the stuff that we added from the circuit board design now let's we go here it shows the program the i'm sorry the make file okay we just verified that the full tinker toy set is safely in the toy box and we're going to check the test program dot c and look at that we have confirmed that my new winter coat is safely in the toy box as well now this happens to be the very first one i had inadvertently deleted the file with all the testing but that's okay at least we got something here so let's go back out and go back to the main if you go back to oh boy let's see scene two now if we go aha okay there, there was a mistake but that's okay the changes we did to do the slow toggling are gone but we can recover from that because I can do that from memory the work I'm going to do to do the high-speed changes is all going to be new so we don't have to worry about those so basically what happened was think of again Christmas morning I accidentally threw away the toy art kit that mom gave me 
when we were throwing away the Christmas wrapping. So that was something naughty, but at least we got something here. So, so I think that it. The next issue is going to be a really long one because we now have to do the timing test for the pulses, okay? So until then, to be continued next week, same time, same channel, as they used to say on the old TV series. I love you all.